Dr. Eccles earned a PhD from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He has published articles in top insurance journals, has acted as a reviewer for several peer-reviewed journals, and has been named the Distinguished Reviewer by the Journal of Insurance Issues. David, we are pleased to have you here today. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I appreciate you guys having me. Uh, today we'll continue with the second assignment in your webinar, and we'll discuss some various uh, property casualty insurance coverages and, and issues. Uh, and then once uh, Dr. Drennan comes back for the life and health coverage uh, assignment, I'll return to discuss the, the final assignment, the, the regulation and legislation session. Uh, but today, uh, we're going to discuss some property and casualty concepts. Uh, in particular, uh, we're going to cover two specific personal lines of insurance policies, that is the homeowners and personal auto policy, uh, two uh, sort of unique property casualty markets, the surplus lines and reinsurance markets. Uh, and then lastly, we'll conclude with the commercial uh, liability insurance coverage, uh, specifically workers' compensation. Uh, but before we get started, let's get an idea as to the familiarity of our participants with some of these, particularly the auto and homeowners policies. Uh, how many of our participants have actually read uh, your homeowners and or auto policies? Uh, this will be our first poll, so go ahead and uh, answer now. All right, well, uh, it looks like at least some of you have some familiarity uh, in terms of having read uh, the, the policy. Uh, so to the extent that, that some of this is, excuse me, oh, I missed that slide there, I'm sorry. Uh, to the extent that some of this is uh, uh, review, uh, please bear with us. Uh, for the rest of you, hopefully this will be a nice overview in terms of, of what the policy covers. And, and before we get fully into the material, I would like to say that these polling questions uh, and the other questions that we'll ask during this seminar uh, are meant to be interactive, and we'd like to have this be as interactive as possible. Uh, so if, if there are any questions, please do use that Q&A um, component so that we can see uh, some of the questions you might have. Well, the reason we start with the, um, the homeowner's policy is that uh, for most individuals, the primary exposure to property casualty risk stems from owning a home uh, and or operating a vehicle. And in fact, the homeowner's policy and the personal auto policy are designed to, to provide rather comprehensive coverage for both the property and liability exposures associated with home ownership and auto ownership. So let's first look, take a look at the case of a home. If you're thinking about the exposures that you have as a homeowner, uh, what immediately comes to mind is a property and or liability associated, uh, property liability exposure associated with having a home. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's All right. Um, well, two obvious uh, property exposures uh, when we think about a homeowner's uh, being, a, being a homeowner, are the structure, the structures that that, that are, exist on the land themselves, as well as the personal property that we have uh, inside the home. Uh, a third, rather obvious exposure is the liability associated uh, with owning a home. That is, a, a roofer falling off the roof, or perhaps a visitor slipping and falling inside your home. And indeed, the standard homeowner's policy covers uh, all of these and more. Uh, before we talk about the homeowner's policy and the auto policy, I'd like to just briefly mention that virtually every insurance company has their own version of a homeowner's or uh, auto policy. Uh, and to that end, it would be virtually impossible for us to discuss every little nuance and every specific uh, coverage that every insurer provides. So what we're going to do instead is talk about sort of a generic form. Uh, these are forms that are printed by the Insurance Services Office. Uh, this is a, sort of an organization that provides uh, 
a generic forms, generic rating advice to insurers. And most of the, the forms that are used by insurers are based off these generic forms. So uh, if you go home and you find that your nationwide premier policy or whatever you might have uh, is slightly different than what we'll talk about here, uh, that's the reasoning. Well, the homeowner's policy has two basic sections. The first deals with the property exposures that we mentioned earlier uh, that come, come along with owning a home. Uh, and the second we'll talk about in a second is the, uh, the liability. Uh, section 1 itself has four coverages, uh, conveniently named coverage A, B, C, and D. Uh, these coverages, uh, coverage A, firstly covers the actual home. So when we think of a home ownership, uh, the home, the dwelling uh, is coverage A. This is sort of the primary coverage. Uh, the limit that we that is used in coverage A is typically the limit thought of that would be useful in repairing or replacing the home should it be destroyed. Uh, B and the sort of coverage B in a similar vein are any detached structures that may also exist on the land. Uh, so this might be a detached garage pool house, maybe a pool itself, uh, something in this vein. Uh, typically, coverage B is about 10% uh, of the limit for coverage B is, the, is about 10% of the limit in coverage A. Though again, this can be uh, changed uh, as necessary. You'll note that both of these coverages are, are covered for what we would call real property. Uh, so real property, as you may have talked about in, in the earlier uh, assignment is anything that's the land or permanently affixed to the land. And so the dwelling or any uh, uh, detached structure uh, would be uh, considered part of this real property. Uh, again, the distinction here um, is one of attachment. The house, the primary dwelling, uh, stands alone uh, from these other detached structures. So to the extent that any of these other structures are actually physically permanently attached to the house, that would actually be considered part of the dwelling itself. Uh, we will also note that at this point we're talking about the property exposures themselves. We're not talking about the perils or the causes of loss. Uh, the various perils that can be covered, can be insured, will be discussed uh, a little bit later, so just bear with us for a second. Uh, section 1 continues uh, with additional property coverage, uh, coverage C. Uh, is the personal property coverage. Uh, the distinction between personal and real property, I like to tell my classes, if you turned your house upside down and shook it, then anything that fell out would be considered personal property. So these are clothes, your TVs, your furniture, these sorts of things. And indeed, the homeowner's policy will cover, uh, cover that personal property as well. This is coverage C, and the limit here is typically about 50% uh, of the coverage A, uh, coverage A limit. Uh, one thing that's a slightly unique uh, regarding the personal property coverage is that it, it's not limited to the property that's physically located at your home or on the premises. So indeed, uh, the coverage will provide uh, coverage for that personal property, uh, usually worldwide. So if your property is stolen uh, overseas or while you're on vacation, oftentimes that property is still going to be covered by your uh, by your homeowner's policy. The fourth and final coverage, at least in Section 1, property related is what we refer to as loss of use. This is one that we didn't mention earlier. Uh, up to now, what we've really been talking about are what we would refer to as a direct loss. That is, we lose our house or we lose the property, we lose the value of that property. And we can imagine the direct loss is that which it costs to repair or to replace that property. Loss of use, on the, other, on the other hand, is what we might refer to as an indirect loss. That is to say that we can't use our house, so now we might incur an additional expense, or we might lose some revenue associated with that, with that home or that property. Uh, you can, I think, readily, e fairly easily imagine situations where this would occur with home ownership. Uh, if your home is destroyed or damaged and you need temporary, re uh, temporary lodging in a hotel or or a temporary rental, uh, this would be an, an indirect cost, an increase in expense, expenses that you wouldn't have ordinarily had. And indeed, this cost would be covered under this coverage D uh, of the homeowner's policy. On the other hand, we can also imagine a loss of revenue. So if we own the home but don't live in it, and in fact perhaps rent it out, 
uh, if that home, if that property is destroyed, we might not be able to get that rental value for months, six months, or whatever. And indeed, again, the loss of use covers the will cover uh, that loss of rental value too. Uh, cover D for the record is approximately, uh, is usually about 30% of the coverage in the All right. Uh, well, I know you're getting tired of hearing my voice, so at this point, uh, John is going to conduct our second poll uh, on the what we just talked about here. Thanks, David. All right, put on your thinking caps. Which Section 1 coverage would respond to windstorm damage to a swimming pool that is separated from the house by a walkway? Would it be under dwelling, other structures, personal property, or loss of use? Please pick your answer. We'll give you about 30 seconds, and then we'll come back and report on that. And the results are coming in, and here they are, David. Let's see. Nobody thought it was covered under the dwelling. Four, or 31%, thought it was covered under other structures. No one thought it was covered under personal property. And one person thought that it was covered under loss of use. So what does it look like, David? Uh, other structures is the winner here? <laughs> yeah, that is the winner, and that is indeed the correct answer. So uh, the key here uh, is that the, the swimming pool is separated by the house, uh, separated from the house uh, in, a, in a significant way. It's just, just a walkway, so it's not attached to the house. Uh, and so at that point, uh, the, the coverage uh, would be under the uh, other structures. Uh, and so I'd like to point out that about 80% uh, of the answers got that right. So we think we're doing a pretty good job uh, at this point. All right, moving forward. Uh, section 2 of the homeowner's policy uh, then just covers liability and medical expenses uh, associated with um, potential losses resulting from the home. Uh, the first coverage in Section 2, coverage E, uh, covers any sort of third-party liability uh, from arising from, from home ownership. And in fact, it's a little bit broader than that. And, and in fact, the coverage is referred to as personal uh, liability coverage. So uh, yes, uh, this will provide coverage for uh, uh, any situation that the homeowner becomes legally liable uh, for uh, loss to, that happens inside the home, whether it's a slip and fall, uh, again, a, a roofer perhaps falls off the, the roof while, while installing, uh, while repairing the roof. Um, if the homeowner is liable for those uh, losses, uh, this liability coverage section E will, uh, will provide coverage for the homeowner. Uh, but it is a little broader than that. Again, as the, the coverage is actually called personal liability, so it provides a, bro a bit broader personal liability coverage for the homeowner, even if it's not specifically uh, having to do with the home. So examples may well be uh, a child throwing a baseball through a neighbor's window or perhaps a dog uh, biting uh, someone at the dog park. All of these would be covered under the personal liability uh, coverage of the homeowner's policy. Uh, in addition to paying for any losses that the, the insured becomes legally liable or legally responsible for, We'll point out that the liability coverage uh, in the homeowner's policy also obligates the insurer to defend, to legally defend the insured. So as long as the limits of the policy are not exhausted, uh, the insurer has to provide for legal counsel 
uh, and these sorts of things uh, under this liability coverage. Uh, the standard limit here is $100,000. Again, as with uh, everything else that we've mentioned, uh, all of these limits can be changed uh, as necessary uh, and as needed by the, by the insured. Uh, the final primary coverage part of the homeowner's policy is Section F, uh, and that is uh, referred to as medical payments to others. Here, again, we're talking about a, a third-party claimant, so neither the, the liability coverage nor the medical payments would pay uh, any medical payments to the homeowner themselves uh, or uh, a homeowner's family member. Uh, rather, these are for uh, third-party claimants. The medical payments uh, are designed to pay relatively minor uh, losses, uh, Typical limits are $1,000 or $5,000. Uh, again, typically ra rather minor medical payments and medical expenses. Uh, the idea here uh, is to avoid court, avoid, avoid litigation. Uh, so to that end, these medical payments are made regardless of fault. Uh, so the, the homeowner does not and here have to be legally responsible or legally liable uh, for the loss. Uh, and indeed, the, the, the insurance policy will still pay. Uh, again, the idea is to simply try to avoid uh, the, the burdensome uh, legal uh, process. All right, well, that's it for the primary coverages of the homeowner's policy. There are a couple of, uh, of options that, we'll like to, that we're going to mention here with respect to homeowner's policy. Uh, the first of which is that the homeowner's policy is actually somewhat mislabeled. Uh, and that is to say, you don't actually have to be a homeowner uh, to, to uh, have a homeowner's policy. So in fact, sure, one of the, some of the standard uh, insureds will be those that actually own the home and occupy the home. We might refer to those as owner-occupants. But tenants, so those that are just leasing or renting a, a, a property, uh, as well as condominium owners uh, who don't own the full building but own only their unit, uh, can also find coverage in a homeowner's policy. And we'll, we'll show you a few uh, of the different homeowner's policies and some of, their op some of the combination of options here in a second after we finish this second option uh, choice, which is the, the peril. So in insurance terminology, perils refers to the cause of loss. So these are the fires, the wind, the flood, these sorts of things uh, that might cause a loss. And in virtually any property policy, what you see is the perils handled in two different ways. It's either done on a named peril basis or an open peril basis. Uh, the named peril is exactly what it sounds like and that they will list, the insurance policy will list the exact perils uh, that are covered under that policy. If the peril is not listed, it's not covered. Now, to be fair, if you ever go and look at a policy, uh, you'll see that it's not just a list of perils and then they stop. And indeed, there's a lot of discussion as to uh, remaining as to what's not covered and in certain situations when covered and non-covered perils are, happen. Uh, but at the basis, this main peril agreement basically just lists the perils that are covered or not. The other option uh, that you see in property policy is what they call an open peril agreement or an all-risk agreement. Here, instead of listing the perils that are covered, the insurer lists the perils that are not covered or that are excluded. And uh, these open peril agreements are typically thought, thought to be broader in the sense that if the, the peril is not excluded, then by definition it must be covered. Right? And so these are oftentimes more um, insurer ed friendly types of forms, and, and they're not uncommon in, in property coverages. Uh, just to, to be clear, uh, most of your standard homeowner's policies are going to cover standard perils, fire, wind, hail. Uh, most are also going to exclude uh, those catastrophic perils that we hear about in the news all the time, floods and earthquakes uh, most prominently. All right. The next two slides then um, sort of show uh, so some of these owner these owner or non-owner, if you will, uh, and uh, 
um, peril combination. So this first slide here shows the, a, a handful of the different uh, homeowners forms for those owner occupants. Uh, the HO3 is probably the most common. Uh, this has sort of an open peril agreement for the for the buildings and a name peril agreement for the property. Um, as an aside, one thing you might notice on the HO2 and HO3 form on this slide is they have uh, broad form and special form. Uh, if you're ever dealing with property insurance policies, you're going to see uh, basic broad and special forms referenced quite a bit. Uh, these are very common peril agreements. Uh, anytime you see special form, that typically refers to an, an, some form of open peril agreement. Uh, and the basic and broad form are uh, some sort of uh, main peril agreement that lists, you know, usually 11 to 13 relatively common perils. Uh, the net side then uh, lists policies that are, that are oftentimes used for non-owners. Uh, so that is to say a renter or a condominium. Uh, unit owner uh, that owns the kind of the unit, but not the, the full building itself. Uh, and again, these are just a couple examples of the type of policies and the names of the policy uh, that are that are often that are often offered by uh, most insurers. All right. Well, that wraps uh, wraps up our homeowners uh, discussion. Uh, we'll now turn our attention to a, a discussion of the auto policy and, and specifically the personal auto policy. Um, we're going to see that there, there are many similarities between the homeowners and auto policy. That is, uh, much like the homeowners policy, uh, the, the personal auto policy, or the PAP, which we often say, uh, will provide coverage not only for the property, uh, that is the car in this case, but also the liability arising out of the operation uh, of that vehicle. Okay, and this is where we had a, a slide up front that was misplaced. I'm going to skip back to that real quick. There we go. Uh, so the um, four primary coverages uh, in, the, in the auto policy, uh, again conveniently named A, B, C, and D, uh, are the liability coverage, uh, medical payments. Again, both of these are very going to be very similar to what we saw in the homeowners policy. Uh, Cover C is going to be a little bit, or Part C is going to be a little bit unique. Uh, that is the uninsured and underinsured motorist coverage. And then Part D is uh, going to be akin to our, our dwelling coverage for the homeowners. It's going to be the physical damage, property damage uh, component um, for the automobile itself. We're also going to discuss uh, what happens in no-fault states. Uh, so the, the way uh, the insurance policy is, is set up in a no-fault state uh, adds to sort of other coverage, this other endorsement called the personal injury protection or the, the PIP. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, as we get there. All right, so I'm going to skip back to our auto policy. We should be uh, okay for now. Um, part A in the liability policy uh, provides coverage that most drivers in at-fault states or tort states, as, as you might refer to them as, refer to them as uh, are required to buy. So in most tort states, uh, you're required to buy some sort of minimum liability coverage, uh, or uh, some states do allow you to prove that you are financially able to cover the claims. But most people find it easier just to uh, to meet this legal requirement uh, with the standard liability coverage uh, in a PAP. And in fact, this Part A is exactly that minimum coverage that is needed to uh, to satisfy most uh, most states' uh, liability. Uh, auto liability insurance uh, requirement. Um, we'll point out that uh, this coverage uh, will provide coverage to the owner of the car uh, as well as to other people that drive the car. Uh, so uh, as you uh, let other individuals borrow your car, you can, uh, you can realize that uh, your coverage will still be in place. As you drive other cars, uh, you can real, you can uh, uh, you should realize that uh, their insurance is in place first. Though, if necessary, yours will uh, will also come, and we would call that an excess coverage. Uh, but in general, uh, the 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 insurance does uh, cover the car, covers the driver, regardless of uh, which actual car they're driving at the time. Uh, the exception to this is if it's a uh, 
uh, a car provided by work or a car used, uh, in, excuse me, in an employment context, uh, those are usually covered under a commercial auto policy. Um, but any sort of personal use of an automobile will be covered by this uh, liability coverage. And again, we'll point out that much like the, the homeowner's liability coverage, what we're talking about here is third-party claims. Right, so this liability coverage is not protecting the driver of the car for their own injuries and their own damage to the car, but rather any, li any uh, issues that the driver becomes liable for um, as a result of operating the car. And, and again, they, they must be found legally liable, uh, so there has to be some sort of uh, legal responsibility before the, before the insurance will attach. Uh, the Part B, the second coverage for uh, in the auto policy is the medical payments coverage. Uh, much like we saw in the homeowner's policy, uh, this provides a relatively modest, a modest amount of coverage. Again, $5,000 is not uncommon. Uh, for relatively minor uh, medical expenses, uh, the difference here between uh, the auto the medical, medical payments and the auto coverage as well as from the homeowner's policy is that this actually will cover the insured. So if you're injured in the car or you're hit by a car uh, as a pedestrian, something of this in this vein, uh, the medical payments will actually provide coverage to the insured. Again, it's a relatively mo modest amount of insurance. Uh, it's done on a no-fault basis. Uh, the, the idea is, again, to try to minimize um, legal cost and if there's a minor issue just to handle it um, straight away. Uh, so if those two were we saw in the homeowner's policy, what we didn't see in the homeowner's policy because there was no need uh, is this notion of uninsured motorist. And so in fact Part C has what we refer to as uninsured motorist coverage as well as another part, the underinsured motorist. These will be two separate things so we'll make sure we make the distinction between those two. But the uninsured motorist coverage basically acts as the liability coverage for the driver uh, if the at-fault party uh, did not have insurance. So imagine you're driving your car and you're fully insured and someone hits you and they don't have insurance. Well, if you have part, this Part C uninsured motorist coverage, then your uninsured motorist coverage will act as if the other driver had liability coverage pay you for your injuries, pay you for your, in some states, your property damage, uh, and so forth. Um, this is not just for, uh, for those absence where there's an uninsured motorist. Uh, indeed, it could be the case that you don't know who hit you. So uh, if you've come back from, your, uh, from the mall and find that someone has hit your car, uh, this, you know, oftentimes they refer to this as a hit and run. Uh, situation. This also is covered under the uninsured motorist coverage, as well as uh, any driver whose insurance company is insolvent. Um, if the if the insurance company of the, if the driver has insurance but the insurance company isn't paying because they're they're out of business, then your uninsured motorist coverage will also uh, kick in here. Uh, it's important to to lastly note that the the motors the uninsured motors that hit you must be liable. Right, so it must have been their fault uh, before your uninsured motors uh, will kick in. Otherwise, uh, if it's your fault, then you'll have to claim under your property damage or your health care or something like this for your losses. The other part of the, the Part C is the underinsured motorist coverage. Um, this is very similar in spirit to the uninsured motorist, but it, it, this applies when the at-fault party simply doesn't have enough insurance. So you can imagine that in, in, in many situations, the drivers are buying the minimum amount of insurance that's required by the state. Uh, and in the situations where that minimum amount of insurance is not sufficient to cover the loss that, that they cause, uh, you as a driver might find yourself out of luck. Uh, the underinsured motorist covers sort of so meets that gap, covers that gap. So if there's any um, difference between your losses and uh, what the, the, the other motorist, the at-fault motorist has in terms of insurance, then the, under, the underinsured motorist coverage uh, will provide uh, coverage there. Uh, 
Again, we'll point out that uh, some states allow property damage to be covered under this, some don't. Uh, and again, the, the underinsured motorists have to be at fault. I mean, they have to uh, have been legally liable uh, for the accident. The, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get you to that side. And that's what we just talked about. So the uh, fourth coverage, the physical damage coverage, Part D of the, uh, of the personal auto policy, uh, provides coverage for the property damage to your, the insured's auto. So the liability, again, was third-party coverage that was providing coverage to someone that you hit, uh, both injuries as well as the property damage. Um, the uninsured and underinsured motorists did provide some, could potentially, I should say, depending on the state, uh, provide some coverage for your um, loss to your car. Uh, but the physical damage coverage is sort of the primary part, uh, the part D of the coverage, where your property uh, is covered in the event that you are, are the at-fault party. So if the insured is at fault, um, hits a pole, hits another car, uh, the physical damage coverage part D is where you'll find coverage. The, uh, as for the liability coverage, this coverage extends to other vehicles. Uh, so a very common situation is a rental car. Uh, you rent a car, uh, your coverage typically will extend to, uh, to that rental car. Uh, one thing that we haven't really talked about up to now is this notion of, deduct of a deductible. I believe you talked about that in, in Dr. Drennan's uh, assignment, uh, the physical damage portion of the auto policy uh, does have a, deduct a, a deductible. So that is a share, uh, a sharing uh, mechanism between the insurance company and the insured. So if you have a loss, you're going to be responsible for $500, $1,000, uh, whatever your deductible is uh, in that uh, situation. Uh, the physical damage coverage, uh, there, there are two options. Uh, one is referred to as collision. Uh, this is fairly aptly named uh, in that uh, it provides coverage for damage to your vehicle uh, if it sort of generically hits something, collides with something. Uh, the one exception to this is uh, collision with an animal. Uh, so the animal, collisions with animals are going to be covered in the next part. But if you hit a telephone pole, if you hit another car, uh, if your car is upset, uh, that doesn't mean it's crying. Rather, it means it, it overturns uh, in insurance terminology. Um, all of these are covered under the collision, um, co the collision part of the physical damage coverage. Uh, again, here there's there's often a dedu deductible associated with that coverage. And again, I'm doing very poorly at moving through these slides. I'll try to be better. So this is the collision coverage. The other option. Uh, also, that rather aptly named is other than collision, uh, and you can imagine that's virtually everything else. Uh, here we do find collisions with animals, so that's sort of the one exception. Uh, but anything else, a fire, a theft, vandalism, these sorts of things are, uh, are covered under, under the other than collision uh, component. Um, this actually, the other than, the other than collision coverage uh, will tend to have a lower deductible than the collision cl coverage. And in fact, in some, some policies, there's no deductible for the other than collision. I notice we haven't got a lot of questions, so I'll pose one to you now, and uh, you can answer or not, but I'm going to move along anyway. But can you think of why, um, why the other than collision component might have a lower deductible uh, from the collision component? Uh, if I get some answers as we move along, we'll come back and, and address that. Um, the, the, the last thing that we'll mention with respect to the auto policy uh, is this sort of um, notion of, of an at-fault uh, versus a no-fault state. Um, historically, most states were sort of this tort state or an at-fault state, so that if you caused an accident, you were responsible for the, the, the cost, whether it be injury costs, property damage loss to, to the individual or individuals that you caused an accident. Uh, some states have, uh, have adopted what they refer to as no-fault uh, statutes or no-fault rules, in which case uh, they sort of say, all right, well, if there's an accident, everybody just goes their separate ways. Right, we're not going to assign fault. Uh, we're not going to burden the, uh, 
the judicial system with, with all these cases uh, when it comes to drivers suing other drivers. Uh, and so you go your own separate way, have your insurance company pay for your loss, the other party's insurance company will pay for their loss. Uh, and in theory, again, this is uh, designed to sort of minimize legal expenses. Um, and to that end, these states that have this sort of no-fault uh, agreement, uh, the way it's handled in the insurance policy is this PIP, this personal injury protection. So it's oftentimes an endorsement that's added to the insurance policy that says, okay, again, if there's an injury or an accident, my insurance company will pay for me, your insurance company will pay for you, and we never really worry about uh, who is at fault or not. Uh, just to be clear, really no state has a true uh, no-fault law, so at some point uh, you're able to sue uh, if the injury, if the accident is bad enough. Uh, some, some states have a, what they might call a verbal threshold, uh, where if there's a drunk driver involved, uh, you can sue. Other states are a little bit more obvious in that they have a, a quantitative threshold, or they might call that a dollar threshold, where uh, if the accident was above a certain dollar amount, the, uh, the parties can sue, the at-fault party can be sued uh, by those that they injured. All right, but otherwise, uh, if, it, if they don't meet that threshold, then the both parties sort of go the way and this personal injury protection, uh, this PIP coverage is what is used. All right. Well, that uh, ends our discussion of the homeowners and, and personal auto policy. Uh, we'll shift gears a little bit now away from specific coverages and, and talk a bit about um, a couple of insurance markets, so to speak, uh, we mentioned earlier, particularly with the homeowner's policy, that there are a couple of perils, earthquake and flood we mentioned, uh, that were hard to insure. Well, uh, in addition to earthquake and flood, there are other risks that are hard to insure, that are relatively unique, that have potentially high losses, that have potentially high probability of loss, where insurance is desired, but it could potentially be difficult for an insurer to find the coverage in sort of what we might refer to as a standard market. So when we go and buy insurance from State Farm or Nationwide, uh, this is what we might think of as sort of a standard market, and we just sort of walk up to the door and we buy insurance. Uh, so oftentimes, again, with these sort of unique perils or hard to insure perils, uh, the standard market doesn't insure them. And, and one way, one market that, is, that does insure them is what they refer to as the surplus mines market. Uh, you often see this referred to as the excess and surplus lines market. So if I say EMS or surplus lines, it's all the same. Uh, the idea here, again, is that uh, this, this market is designed to help place coverage for some of these uh, examples that we've, that we've mentioned um, that are hard to insure, that are we might call non-standard, that are unique, that require some sort of new form, new underwriting, these sorts of things. Uh, and there they go to the uh, EMS market. Um, this happens, again, uh, oftentimes insurers are unwilling to cover a lot of these losses. Uh, you might have, re have heard about the, the Warren Buffett's bracket challenge back in the spring where Quicken offered a million, a billion dollars to uh, anyone that could correctly guess all the uh, March Madness teams correctly. And of course, they wanted to insure that risk. They didn't want to pay a billion dollars, as is understandable. And so they, they tried to get insurance. And in fact, Warren Buffett very famously offered them insurance for what a lot of people, I think, felt was relatively expensive cost. But at any rate, he offered them coverage. And this is something where a very, very good example where the, the EMS market would have provided coverage for uh, something that was unique, something that hadn't been really offered before, and something that uh, frankly, probably most insurers were unwilling to um, to offer coverage for. Uh, along those same lot lines, uh, insurers that are in sort of high loss situations, so those that are prone to flooding, uh, prone to high wind losses, uh, might well find it very difficult to 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 find coverage uh, in these standard markets. And individuals that at that point can go to these ENS markets. Um, there are other options that we'll talk about in the legislation and 
regulation uh, assignment of this webinar. Uh, but the ENS market is one place where these sort of high risk um, exposures and insurers might well find uh, in coverage, might find coverage. Um, in general, uh, again, uh, the ENS market pro provides uh, the insureds, those that need it, an opportunity to find these coverages that might require higher limits. That's the billion dollars. Uh, broader coverage, this might be um, the, the earthquake or flood that is oftentimes hard to, to insure, uh, as well as anything that new that pops up. So uh, more recently, this might have been a cyber liability policy five years ago, something. Uh, to this end. Um, we're here to our first sort of what do you think. Are there other uh, surplus lines examples that, that you might uh, think of other situations where surplus lines market might uh, come into play? Feel free to answer in the chat. Now they can put comments in the question and answer box and yeah. we'll share them as we see them. Okay, well, uh, at least one person mentions uh, zoos. Uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty good idea, uh, a, a good example. Uh, a relatively unique risk, you have animals that, you know, can, uh, are, that if we think of them as property themselves, could call, could, there could be a loss that they uh, cause the, a loss to a human, could it happen. Um, I'll also add, whenever you see uh, the, those TV shows of, of of, um, of buildings imploding, uh, this would be a relatively unique situation where a uh, high risk uh, situation where the losses could be really high and oftentimes you find coverage in this uh, EMS market. Okay, that's, that's a good question. Um, there are some, uh, the question was is, uh, that we just got is, is reinsurance uh, under EMS. Uh, the reinsurance market and the EMS market are separate. You do, you do see some reinsurers position themselves as uh, EMS providers, um, but technically uh, they're sort of what we would think of as sort of separate uh, markets. But you could have a, a reinsurer to call themselves and, and, and surplus, uh, uh, surplus provider, but, but they're, not, uh, they're not synonymous, in other words. All right, very good question. All right, uh, and then lastly, uh, before we talk about reinsurance, I'll provide a nice little segue here in a second. Um, EMS is somewhat unique. Again, so we mentioned this idea of a standard market. Uh, when you think about the standard market, the state farms and nationwide, these are sort of registered in the, in the various states. They're legislated uh, by the states. They're regulated by the states. Uh, EMS insurers are not. Um, so they are oftentimes what they refer to as a non-admitted insurer. Uh, and we won't get into it here, but there are some advantages and disadvantages to that uh, for the insurer as well as the insured. Uh, but at this point, you can just suffice it to say that they're not technically licensed to license in the state. That doesn't mean they can't sell insurance, but they have to do it on a, on a much different basis. Um, and in fact, the way that is done is through what they call an EMS broker. So uh, unlike State Farm and Nationwide, we can't just walk up to an EMS provider and buy insurance. Rather, we have to have someone else, uh, that is an EMS broker, to place that business for us. Uh, that broker will, will have a list, will know who they can use. Some states maintain list of approved insurers. Some states just maintain the opposite of non-approved insurers to so say you can't use these. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, the states, do regulate these uh, slightly differently, uh, uh, but, but it's still available to even individual uh, policy holders. All right, uh, and then as promised, uh, we had a question a minute ago about reinsurance. Again, a nice segue. Um, reinsurance, as I mentioned, is not synonymous with ENS. Uh, reinsurance uh, provides a solution to a, a specific problem, and that is one of where do insurance companies get insurance? Uh, and in general, reinsurance is not really any different than insurance. It's, uh, to that end, it's a relatively easy concept. Uh, and all it really is an insurance is an insurance company simply buying insurance for the insurance that they've sold. So you can imagine 
uh, I'm using State Farm, I know a lot here's an example of them selling a lot of policies and then packaging those policies that they, they sold and transferring that risk or that liability to another insurance company. And that is the, effectively uh, the reinsurance transaction. If the losses on that sort of bulk business are high enough, then State Farm will will receive some compensation from their insurer. But at the end of the day, it's simply uh, insurance for insurance companies. Uh, there are slight differences in the terminology. Uh, so in fact, you oftentimes see the word seeding or sedent uh, being referred to, uh, referring to the insurance companies that are doing the, um, they're engaging in the transaction. You'll see this notion of a seeding commission, uh, which is effectively the same thing as a premium. Um, uh, and so again, uh, it's effectively the same thing as, as primary insurance, except now the insurance company is buying it. You can also imagine that this does not stop with one insurer, doesn't have to reinsure anyway. Uh, so they have what they call retro sessions, where a reinsurer will buy reinsurance from another reinsurer. And this uh, situation can go on sort of uh, in infinitely if necessary. Um, but again, it's a way for insurance companies to sort of protect themselves if they have uh, significant losses. Now, the good news for an individual is that they typically don't see any of this transaction, nor is it that important to them. So in fact, the policy, the primary policyholder, that is the policyholder that buys the insurance from State Farm, could really care less as to whether or not uh, State Farm buys the reinsurance or not. Uh, indeed, they, the primary policyholder will, will rarely see any part of that transaction or be involved in any part of that transaction. Uh, and indeed, uh, that transaction does not does not make State Farm or the primary insurance company uh, not responsible to the primary insurer. They still maintain their responsibility to the insurer, to the insured, which they sell the policy to. Uh, they now just have a little backup should they have significant losses. Uh, two exceptions to this are what they refer to as a cut-through endorsement. Uh, this occurs when um, typically a larger uh, insured is going to want to make sure that their insurer is solvent, uh, and if not, uh, they can um, collect from the reinsurer. Uh, and another situation occurs, again, with the relatively large ins insureds uh, when they use captives. So if a big company basically sets up their own insurance company, uh, they primarily do this to access the reinsurance market. And so really these are the, the two sort of primary exceptions to when the primary insured would be dealing with the reinsurer themselves. But these are, these are typically used for relatively large policyholders or relatively large insured. All right. Uh, and then our last little uh, module here, last little portion, is this notion of uh, worker, workers' compensation. Uh, this represents yet another slight shift in sort of our focus in that um, we talked about uh, individual uh, lines of insurance, homeowners and property, and, and the auto coverage. We talked about a couple of insurance markets. Uh, but here, workers' compensation is typically uh, what, what we think of as a commercial insurance line. That is, we have workers' compensation insurance, anyway, is bought by, uh, by companies, businesses that, that are required to, uh, required to do something, I'll say generically, under the workers' compensation statutes. All right, so before we actually talk about the insurance itself, uh, let's just point out that uh, workers' compensation typically refers to, uh, in gen generically anyway, the laws that are required that are set up by the states to protect uh, employees uh, when they have injuries on the job. So indeed, most states have some sort of workers' compensation statute uh, that provide, uh, that require that their employers Thank you. That provide that their employers uh, provide some sort of financial responsibility for any sort of uh, loss that, is a, that, is a, that occurs on the job. Uh, the workers' compensation statute does not say that they have to buy insurance for this. We'll discuss that in a second. Rather, that the only that the employer has to be responsible for those losses that occur on the job. Uh, this these. This responsibility is done, again, on a no-fault basis. Uh, we've seen that before. So again, there doesn't have to be any liability. No one says it's the employee or the employer's fault. If it happens on the job, 
uh, sort of by definition, it's covered under the, the workers' comp and workers' compensation law or the statute um, in that state. Different states have different rules as to what's covered, what's not covered. Uh, that's a little bit beyond the scope of, of this discussion, but do recognize that your state might, might differ from uh, a neighboring state. Uh, again, the idea, as with any no-fault coverage, is to sort of uh, go ahead and get, get the coverage, the, the loss paid, do it uh, without the use of uh, the court system, so we're trying to minimize uh, legal burdens, uh, litigation costs, et cetera. Uh, the coverage uh, that is provided uh, in general is, is um, under these statutes are medical expenses and wage loss, uh, and these are all due to work-related, uh, occupation-related injuries and or diseases. Uh, specifically, uh, these things, the benefits that are available are medical benefits, uh, disability income benefits, uh, whether it's a temporary disability, a permanent disability, a partial disability, or a total disability, uh, all of these are payable under workers' compensation statutes, uh, in addition to rehabilitation benefits, and lastly, uh, in, in the case where death occurs, death benefits to survivors. So this might, be, this might include um, a burial expenses as well as lost income uh, for a certain duration. The... Uh, the employers that are covered on these statutes, again, vary uh, across states. Uh, for the most part, uh, it's most uh, employers. Uh, the common exemptions include farm uh, employers, uh, uh, farm laborers, uh, sort of one-off uh, um, con contracting situations, uh, casual employers, employees such as um, uh, like a gardener or, or a cleaner, something of this in this vein. Uh, different states also will exempt smaller businesses. Uh, this might be five to ten employees. Uh, but again, this will vary by state. Uh, most employers in most states are covered by the workers' compensation statutes and therefore are required to provide this coverage to their, provide this benefit uh, to their employees. Uh, so how do they... Uh, how do they do this? Up to now, we've just mentioned that the workers' compensation statute requires that employers pro provide uh, this financial security, but the statute does not say that the employer has to buy insurance. Uh, however, of course, you would probably not be surprised to find out that the easiest way to deal with this, to, to meet this requirement, is indeed to, um, uh, to buy the workers' compensation insurance. Uh, this insurance is usually by statute uh, meets the requirement uh, that the statutes require uh, to provide this financial security. All right, so we're going to ask our last polling question, or John, rather, is going to ask our last polling question while I give a sip of water. Thanks, David. Our polling question, what are some sources from which employers can acquire insurance? Is it the voluntary market of private insurers? Is it the assigned risk plan? Is it a state fund? Or might it be all of the above? We'll give you 30 seconds to choose the correct answer. And the results are in, and no one has chosen voluntary market or the assigned risk plan. No one has chosen state funds, and all have designated all of the above. What do you think of that, David? I think that's pretty good, John. Uh, so, in fact, that's the right answer, and this provides a nice little tease for our next session, uh, or the next session you have me for, the legislation and... Uh, regulation section, where we will talk about what, what these needs. We've talked a lot about the voluntary market. We haven't used that terminology. Those are the private insurers. Uh, but the assigned risk plan, uh, state funds, all are going to be options for um, 
employers when looking for uh, this insurance. Uh, in addition to these possibilities, uh, buying insurance, uh, whether it's on the voluntary market via assigned risk plan, et cetera, uh, insurers, uh, sorry, employers oftentimes can do it themselves or do it with a group. Uh, so it's not uncommon to see large employers self-insure. That is to say, they just say, we have enough employees, uh, we have enough ability to calculate what we think our losses are going to be, and so we're going to pay for them ourselves. Uh, we don't need the insurance. The premiums we would pay would be effectively what we're going to pay anyway, so we might as well pay for it ourselves. Uh, large companies, again, uh, will oftentimes do this. Groups, uh, particularly industry groups, will often do this as well. Uh, so they'll get together and combine their employee base and, again, sort of what we might call self-insure uh, that group. Uh, when this does occur, this this can be used to meet the workers' compensation requirements in the state. Uh, usually, the state will, will require some sort of surety bond from the, from the employer uh, to guarantee that the financial security is there, uh, whether it's from a, an individual employer or a group. Uh, and also, oftentimes, the employers or the groups uh, that utilize this sort of self-insurance mechanism uh, will use a third-party administrator to handle the claims. So one of the big benefits of insurance, buying insurance, is that you have this sort of claims handling ability uh, that, say, a large business might not have. And so they solve that problem by uh, utilizing a TPA or a third-party administrator uh, to manage the claims. Well, that wraps it up for us. Um, we have. Uh, We've discussed a couple of things that hopefully you found useful, a couple of some various property casualty topics, including the homeowners and personal, policy, personal auto policy, a couple of insurance markets, the surplus lines, the reinsurance market, as well as this uh, workers' compensation, uh, the sort of the commercial coverage. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to, to John to conclude for today. Dr. David Eccles, thank you for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge with our audience. And thanks to you who have attended this session. We appreciate your participation in our soft lunch. Soft launch. Almost time for lunch. <laughs> Within a few days, you will receive an email message with a link to a post-event survey. Please remember that we need your feedback, and this is your opportunity to help shape the development of these new delivery options. Today's webinar was the second in a four-part series. Our next webinar will be on Monday, July 21st, when Dr. Rob Drennan will present Insurance Coverages, Life and Health. And our series concludes on Monday, August 11th at noon, when Dr. Eccles returns to present Insurance, Regulation, and Legislation. You can register for these webinars from links in the email we sent earlier, or you can simply visit the www.griffithfoundation.org website. Thanks again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.